Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to another News Philanthropy Network seminar and workshop. We're really thrilled to have you with us today. We hope you were able to enjoy the summit, which was now two weeks ago, uh, where we had uh, nearly a thousand people sign up to attend three days worth of conferences, uh, presentations, and lectures, and discussions and workshops and community conversations. It was a lot of fun. And if you were there, I hope you found it really helpful. We were really thrilled to have Chandra with us um, at the summit, uh, presenting this topic on ethical storytelling and exploring a human-centered approach to curating social impact. It's such an important body of work and something particularly in our industry as fundraisers and in journalism, we need to be very uh, aware of, sensitive to, and take very, very seriously. So thank you, Chandra, for coming back again to redo this um, presentation. It was so well received at the summit. We're delighted to be able to offer it a second time. For folks who don't know Chandra harris McRae, she is the Vice Chancellor of Strategic Marketing and Communications at the University of Illinois in Chicago, which I just told her is now one of my favorite cities in the world. I love Chicago. Uh, she is an award-winning inclusive and integrated strategist and architect of campaign, brand, content, and engagement blueprints across multimedia. We're delighted to be working with her and to partner with the Inclusion Firm, a national consulting practice focused on developing inclusive strategies for organizational change and delighted that the head of that firm, Angelique Grant, is also with us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chandra. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat. And when she's done with her presentation, uh, we'll go back into the Zoom room all together and, and be able to have a conversation. Thanks again, Chandra. Thank you so much, Annie, for that thoughtful introduction. I want to spend the time today really diving deep in to ethical storytelling and really centering on empowering and not um, creating a different measure other than empowering. And so to do so, I would like to start off with a story and then we'll proceed on into our journey. Growing up in a poor Chicago neighborhood, my father would wake before the sun to go to work. He worked as a laborer on the railroad. Every day before he would get to work, he would pick up the Chicago Tribune newspaper. For some reason, he'd hold on to that paper until he got home at 3 p.m. every day, and then he'd sling it on our rickety small kitchen table and call me to read it to him. From a small child through high school, and even when I would come back home from college, I read to my father because he couldn't read for himself. He was illiterate. This is only one part of my story told in one way. My question to you is, is it ethical storytelling? We'll come back to that and explore that question more at the end of this presentation. So let's move on and first define ethical storytelling. When you think of ethical storytelling, I would like for us to think of it in terms of social change communications without exploitation. So this then means that the storyteller is the one who is telling their story. In my case, the story of me reading to my father is my story to tell that I choose then to share with you or someone else or a reporter or a writer, you fill in the blank then they decide to write it and share it more widely with an audience who hopefully can create impact for good because of it. So let's go a little bit deeper into the understanding and practice of what it means to be a story sharer. So notice I'm using this term story sharer because we just defined that it's not our story to tell. The storyteller is the person whom the story belongs to and we get to be the story sharer. So from that perspective, I really wanna spend some time talking about what it means to not be the storyteller, what it means to have power with and not over. And then lastly, we'll consider some questions that will take us beyond just good intention. So let's begin with this premise. You are not the storyteller. I cannot lay this in any more than I already have. 
that it's really important for you to begin sitting with and shifting through your role when someone else is sharing their story. I'll say it again. You are not the storyteller. Storytelling should not be transactional. It should be you listening to someone and listening deeply to what they're sharing with you to then become the story sharer. Going a little bit more into this, when I say you are not the storyteller, you get the privilege, the privilege of listening to someone else's story, their journey, and then you get to share it. So setting your posture, your positioning is so critical to the journey of ethical storytelling. Once you've gotten your posture in check, then the honesty must continue to formulate the goals of why are we sharing this story? Do you want to spark conversation? Then you must provide the time and space for the conversation to occur. Do you want others to share the stories or give in support of like stories? Then you have to give a mechanism to do so. These are just examples of first steps of posture and goals and why they're necessary to interrogate and they should not be skipped over. Only then from there, we can then start to explore this question of how do we create equitable outcomes for all members of our community? We can start by defining people by their aspirations, not their challenges. We do this by harnessing asset framing. I hope you all, all know this amazing human Trayvon Shorters. He really pioneered asset framing. And it really means you see the hope and the inspiration and aspiration of humanity. You don't see the at risk this, a poor that, or a low income, income, low income this. You're not the savior. You see the hope before the problem. Another way to think about it, you actually see the dream and not the person's current circumstance. So you see them as human, instead of making them into an object need, that needs to be dealt with or defined, or like I said, to be saved by you or your organization. Whatever that aspiration is, if it's I aspire to be a scientist, I aspire to be a leader, or maybe I just aspire to graduate from high school, whatever that aspirational goal is, acknowledge that first before you go into one's various challenges. That is living asset framing. And then you are telling a truer, more real story as a story sharer. Lastly, in nonprofit organizations or any organization for that matter, it is often strategy leading the day. And then the strategy sets the tone for how folks are to act. Well, that's just not how humans work. Now do they? Narrative frames what we do, how we do, what we do, who we do it with, and it really forms our identity. So framing your nonprofit's narrative, your organization's narrative, your story is just as critical as any strategy or hearing the story of someone else. And then understanding how others shape your narrative is even more paramount. Recognizing that people had values and aspirations before you ever even showed up or were even thought of, and that's key to the narrative. Why am I saying this? Your organization should not stigmatize or create a negative narrative in order to incite action from stakeholders or even to gain sympathy from a larger public because you stigmatize or stereotype the very community you likely are intending to serve or that your mission is even founded upon. When you think of narrative, I think of this quote that a wise person once said, there are always three sides to a story, the story you tell, the story you hear, and the story that is truth. I wanna add a fourth to that wise person quote, what about the story you're not hearing? 
Think about the stories you are not hearing and how critical that is to the ethical use of story. Stories are extremely personal and therefore powerful and persuasive. They can affect great change in an organization and the way a person perceives a situation or even other people in the world. To be a true narrative leader, story sharer, you must respect and uphold the highest ethical standards when gathering stories. Working with people who choose to share their story with you. So now that we've talked about what it really means not to be a storyteller, when you become a story sharer and you center on asset framing, you also have to leverage this practice of power with and not over. Mm. I call this out because you may not remember the points I just shared, but if you can play on repeat, power with, not over power with, not over, then your actions will and should follow. There's a Nigerian writer who spoke in 2009 on a TED talk about the danger of a single story in power. Nagoso said how stories are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not to just tell or share the story of another person, but to make it the definite story of that person. Power with, not over. If I'm walking across the street and you see me and you hate me, so you intentionally run me over, that's terrible. On the other hand, if I'm walking across the street and you're not paying attention and you still run me over, it doesn't matter to me because the outcome is still the same. I am not alive, likely. So think about impact in this case, quite literally, means more than intent. So let's explore how to move beyond intention with practical questions you can use and practice. So in thinking about going beyond good intentions, think about these questions. The first centered on consent. Do we have the person's permission to share their story for this purpose and in this medium? Before you even jump into story gathering mode, take a look a good look at your informed consent documents. Better yet, have someone from the outside take a look at them. You might want to offer choices about the ways in which an individual story will be shared. For example, can a story be shared anonymously, depending on what is being shared, or in certain circumstances only, or in certain formats, or only with certain audiences? Let's think beyond this one size fits all. That's not the world we live in. So let's not try to make that true for the story that we're seeking to share. On this same note, before you dive into consent, what about just having a conversation with the individual about what they want out of this, what their intent is, what they hope it will be. And then if that aligns with your purpose, your organization's purpose, then share the consent form. I really believe that human to human, we need to spend time actually seeing one another. And that builds a bridge of trust. Secondly, consider who is at the center, whose needs and desires are at the center of how the story is presented. Who is the protagonist of the story? Is it the actual person or is it the organization you're representing? Who is empowered? Whose needs and desires are at the center of that story? Thirdly, what is being reinforced? Are you sharing the story in a way that reinforces harm, stereotypes, or stigmas about a social issue or the people who are affected by it? That's where this asset framing comes into play. Really think about how you're presenting the story and how does it reinforce 
and hopefully not reinforce stereotypes or stigmas. And lastly, we must have story with accountability. It's not enough to simply gain the story and tell the story by being a story sharer, but we also have to think about what will happen to the person after you share the story. Could it cause harm? Are you compensating them? Are you going to continue in the relationship? And again, being truthful and upfront about that. So I'll tell my story once again, but in a different way. My father planted a dream, a seed within me. He fertilized that seed and watched it grow by pouring into me all that he had, by also desiring me to read the Chicago Tribune to him daily after school. He could not read, but he didn't have to because I was his vessel to what was happening in the world. And he gave me the greatest gift of seeking out words, stories as a way of being, that I became a journalist, the writer of words that I once read to him. Knowing what we know now, let's go back to that original question. Is this ethical storytelling? It's the same story, but told in a different way with the principles and the remembrances that I have just shared with you. If you desire to learn more about inclusive storytelling or any other philanthropic practices of inclusion and equity, please reach out to the inclusion firm. Angelique Grant is the brainchild behind the inclusion firm and I have the privilege of standing along with her and others to really tell and be part of you all stories to drive impact and organizational change. It is truly, truly, truly our jam professionally for the inclusion firm and how we live our lives. Thank you all so much for, for being part of this conversation. I will be delighted to support you in the conversation we're getting ready to have and beyond that. So always feel free to reach out to me directly at Chandra at theinclusionfarm.com or on LinkedIn. Um, Chandra, thank you so much. That was incredible. And I think, I know I have lots of questions and I think really um, seeds the ground for a really fertile conversation. So if anyone else wants to drop questions in the chat, please do, or feel free to raise your hand and you can um, ask them verbally. Um, but I guess I can start and jump in and we can we can kick off the conversation. And I guess uh, this might be broad. And so I apologize if this is a little all over the place. But one of the things I'm interested in specifically as it relates to journalism is so many of the successes in reporting and journalism, you get prizes and things about investigative stories about terrible things that happen to people or reporting on awful breaking news. And it feels weird to, in a sense, celebrate those milestones when you're at something, it's in response to something negative, but also those milestones can be hugely motivating and powerful in terms of generating philanthropic support. And I guess I think all the strategies you outlaid in, in the conversation get to that, but I would be curious to hear how you can think about balancing those needs when so much of the, the work of journalism is focused on things that you're maybe engaging people with at not a, a great moment of their lives, I suppose. Absolutely, Yossi. I think the, you know, I, I won't even say, I think I know the first part is being clear, intended, so I think oftentimes when something negative is happening in the world, we tend to jump to the conclusion of that negativity. And you know, how many moments have you been watching the news or reading the newspaper and someone's son has been murdered? And the question is, how do you feel about this? Is that really the question that we're asking in that moment? You know, like if you take a step back, that's likely not the question that should be asked, right? It's more so reaching out to that mother to say, you have just experienced 
an enormous tragedy, tragedy that I can't even relate to, but I want to tell the story of who your son was. And I hope that by us telling the story, we can create change, right? So, you know, having being objective, but at the same time being human, which I know that there is a fine line, right? Um, but I think that's necessary so, so folks understand and feel trustworthy to be able to share their story in terms of those hard moments where tragedy is happening. So it's really baking in the humanness of who we are as humanity. I think that goes a long way when you're reaching out to someone who has experienced something traumatic. And then secondly, being clear on the intention of mm -hmm. I am reaching out to you because X, Y, Z. So again, it's that power with and that power over in an effort to be able to share that person's story in a way that hopefully will bring light to the issue and then also bring change, right? So being really clear on those two purposes, I think y'all see really defines how we should be interacting under those moments versus, um, you know, let me, let me ask how you're feeling about this because that probably isn't the best question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And at least from, this is a little different than the focus of this conversation, the newsroom and traditionally within journalism, there is such an aversion. You never let a source see your story before you publish it. You don't give prior review, that type of thing. But I imagine when we're talking about philanthropic communications and messaging to funders and things that are a little outside the realm of journalism, that having those types of conversations can be a, a powerful way to do that power with instead of power over type. Right. Absolutely, you see, and I understand, you know, having been bred, if you will, in journalism and now on the higher education and philanthropic side of the house, they are different, right? Like there's more latitude when you're talking about a donor giving a significant gift to support an entity at the institution, you do want to ensure that it, it is, is up to their par that they wanna share it in the way they share it. And that includes everything from phone calls, double checking to sharing, you know, it just depends on who that person is. But I also feel in journalism, even if you, you know, our rule is not to share, if you build that trust with that individual or, or individuals, then once you write that story, you can have peace about how you built that relationship, right? And what you decided to, to choose to get. And also think about what is not being said. You know, have you really resourced all of the entities to get to the heart of the story? What do you mean by that, by resource all the entities, just in terms of the way you're reaching out to folks? and Exactly, things? exactly. You'll see, I think oftentimes we have one or two resources. And as I said in the uh, presentation, think about the story you haven't heard. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so if if one person is saying this to be true and the police are saying this to be true, is there someone else? And the answer could be no. But I think we need to beg the question, is there someone we haven't spoken to that maybe has that fourth prong or fourth leg, if you will, to the story? Yeah. And, and oftentimes those extra phone calls, those um, extra discussions can really help humanize the story in the sense that it's not he said, she said type of, of thing as well, which often doesn't get the full complexities. And that actually gets to something else I'm really interested in, especially as it relates to philanthropic and fundraising messaging, the idea of who's at the center of a story and so much of, especially with fundraising, either if it's solicitations or stewardship, it's help us do this work, but you're leveraging someone else's story to, put yourself at the center in a sense, so you can get donors or supporters to buy in to your message. And so how do you balance that without making yourself the hero in a sense when you're working with other people and, and really engaging in the work that is involved in their lives, I suppose? Absolutely, Yossi, and that's just such a paramount and important question, right? I think oftentimes, you know, stories are told from this sad, bleak, you know, we can't do this, we can't have water in Africa, or we need shoes on these children, et cetera. And it's such from this um, negative asset framing place. 
that's why I, I tend to want to spread to the world of what if we just chose asset framing and not from this place that's really, um, you know, a low hit, so to speak. You know, we all have journeys, we all have circumstances that evolve and get us to this point. Why not focus in on the dream, right? And focus in on the impact um, of what your giving does. So instead of this sad, poor country, what about this country has the ability to accomplish dot, 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 and because of your giving, that's possible, right? Um, so I think it's really important to, to really understand the story that your own organization is sharing. I think it's a miss when an organization feels like they're gonna save whatever child or whatever country or whatever the circumstances. And to see that again, those individuals as human beings before I ever even arrived, right? Before I as a nonprofit, before I as an organization, before I with means to be able to do things, what is the story we're telling of our organization and can we center in on impact? Um, you know, if you give $50, then you're able to purchase books for this school. And because of that, Chandra then has the ability to become a teacher. And that's what she's always dreamed of doing, right? So it's really just shifting how we think about how money has this ability to create impact and then create ripple effects of making dreams come true versus Chandra is poor and she doesn't have the means and without you, she can't have a book. You know, it's just a different way to tell the story. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think focus, it, at least I know from our experience at the Lundfest Institute, when we focus on, on donor messaging and things like that, we often see more resonance and more success when we focus on those individual stories and the opportunities that it presents and how journalism and the work is building stronger community and specific examples of stories and reporting that has changed lives as opposed to the higher level, more amorphous journalism is good for democracy right. type of exactly. thing. And so, right, right. Yeah, so I imagine that focus on individuals and that emphasis on storytelling um is important ashley ford also dropped a, a question in the chat which i think is a good one ashley i'm happy to read it or if you want to come off and ask it yourself you're more than welcome to or ignore okay i will ask it then do you have any strategies for inspiring your organization to shift mindsets from a savior perspective in donor communications absolutely ashley i think the the first critical piece is education, right? Because um, I think most organizations feel like they're doing what's best and they're well-intended and they're seeing results from that. So it's really having your organization, the willingness for you even actually to be able to educate and say, well, let's consider this, meaning asset framing. And this work has created this positive reservoir for other organizations like ours by fill in the blank, you know, the data point, right? So I'm not oblivious to think that you can simply educate and not have data to support it. So the first piece is educating and giving the definition of asset framing, what that would look like in your organization, I believe in before and after. So taking a story that maybe wasn't written from that space, reframing it, being able to share something actual tangible of how we could do this work where it doesn't feel overwhelming to you and others to really consider how to rethink. And then the data to support it. You know, in our industry, we believe in the A and B testing. So say your organization says, okay, Ashley, we hear you that we need to be doing asset framing. This is great work that you've done in terms of reframing how we tell our stories why, you know, I don't see a need to do this. So if they say no, then another option is let's do A and B testing. Let's take what we had before and take what was redone and take stakeholders, divide that audiences into an A and B group and share both. And then you have immediate data from your own constituency base and your own audiences to then be able to share and then be able to make that case even stronger. So I believe in the educational portion, but I also believe in the actionability of it because oftentimes 
you know, when I'm on the other end, I feel like organizations are already so overwhelmed and already at capacity to bring one more thing in supposedly really upsets the apple cart. And I think if you can present a different way forward by actually doing some of that work um, and then presenting it to show how it's relative and relevant and meaningful to your organization, oftentimes that turn to do this work in this way changes the modality and certainly changes from a donor perspective because you oftentimes will see more reactions as well as giving when you create it from an asset place because you know everyone wants to be the hero right and so if the donor is seen as the hero in a way that is positive that certainly elicits elicits more good than not let me know ashley if i answer that i tend to answer with many answers <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have actually a follow up off of that, and this may be a, a too broad of a question, so tell me if it is, but are there in your experience, obviously this depends on the type of messaging and the type of platform, but specific metrics or specific areas that you have found to be successful in helping to make that case? Yeah, so I would say email is definitely one that you can really test that. Again, you'll see with that A and B testing, so it's the same overarching message, but uh, channeled in different ways, right? Of how the organization typically does it, and then how can we sh shift this to be more dream-induced, impact-induced, asset framing-induced, and then sharing both of those messages via email and actually tracking the open throughs and the click throughs, as well as the actual giving, if there's giving tied to it. And then you have an apple to apple comparison, right? When you can take what was meant to be the same message, but just adapt it differently. I think other areas is really thinking about having, you know, most organizations have a board or um, an editorial board, a small group of folk that are thought leaders within that organization and using that group to say what really resonates with you. Um, you know, how can we do better? So almost as an interior focus group to overarching message. So what I offered as the first examples were really tactical, right? But what if you wanted to take it from, let's relook at our mission vision and purpose and understand what is our overarching message and do that with that smaller board or a small focus group to really harness the strategy of your messaging. So therefore, when you filter down to the tactics, the message is central to all of those tactics versus a one-off. Um, so those are two examples that, you know, when you talk about mediums that, that could really work for this work. Thank you. That that makes a ton of sense and is super helpful. And I'm obsessed with A-B testing on email also, depending, the platforms make it really easy to do. Right. So right. totally appreciate you suggesting that. And we have another question in the chat from Jalen, and I'll read it. And Jalen, feel free to come off chat if you want, off mute if you want to add to it. But um, he writes, I'm wondering, given your experience in higher ed, do you have any advice for sharing the stories of students when there may be a significant age gap, especially communicating to older donors why these stories from relevant, younger people are important and relevant? This is a great question, Jalen. I like to think um, learning is um, for all, right? Like it's not dependent on your age. And certainly thinking of higher education and how our models due to the pandemic and other things in our landscape are changing, higher education is meant for not just your 18 year old, but your non-traditional students as well, as well as those who've already gone on and received multiple degrees and they may come back to school. Or in the case of my alma mater, they bring in those who are retired to come back to the institution to learn. And that becomes a bridge moment to be connective to young, young students that are at the institution or non-traditional students. So I say that Jalen to say, how, how when we think about higher education and who's in the room, let's think about who's in the room, right? So if you have a scholarship dinner, why not invite those donors to sit at a table with eight college students? Oftentimes they're blown away and impressed not only with their thought and their smartness and their capabilities, but then they 
are able to take a step back and say, oh, this is not all that different from when I was in school, right? In terms of the, the aptitude for gaining more knowledge. So I think if we think of it from the base of that we're all learners, then age really doesn't matter. To your point of how do you make the story relevant? Say you don't have the ability to get folks into a room of all ages and genres, et cetera, then how do you begin to make it relevant to older boards, um, older donors, et cetera? I think centering in on the impact. So less about that this is an 18 year old and more about the aptitude and the willingness that you're providing as a donor, whether that be a gift, whether that be your time, whether that be in mentorship, makes a difference for this student and all the students that come after them because that student then has the ability to have a ripple effect. So thinking less about the one individual and more about the legacy impact that we all have the ability to create when we do tell the story to those different constituencies. And again, Jalen, using that asset framing, um, because that's to me, that's where humanity lives. If we can focus in on the dream and making that dream a reality. Um, um, I was muted and I have, I'll ask another question and jump in, but please feel free to raise your hand or just jump in or drop it in the chat if, if anyone else wants to ask anything. Um, one of the, questions, the points you brought up earlier that I thought was really interesting as well was this conversation of thinking about why you're sharing the story to spark conversation, to um, provide space for, con uh, for conversation or to um, encourage people to give and that that should help and define how you're telling it. I would be so curious to hear some examples maybe of in your experience how you went about telling maybe the same story in different ways based on the intention and if there are strategies you would recommend for folks here about how to think about doing that to um, help frame their stories, I suppose. Yes, absolutely, Yossi. So I'm gonna talk from the higher education nonprofit space. So oftentimes, because our constitu constituencies are very varied, you know, you have legislators as one constituency, alumni as another constituency, students as another constituency, faculty and staff as another constituency. So it's really centering on where those folks fall into the journey. And what I mean by that is if you have a parent of a student at the institution, likely that parent wants their child to succeed. And so if we have a donor who's giving to a particular scholarship for the success and wholeness and well-being of a student, then that story may be reframed to the parent to say, your child now has these resources and that they can use for mental health, for um, educational support. And by the way, that was created through this particular partnership and program. So it's really centering the constituency and what matters to them. That would look different if it was a donor that we were trying to attract to that particular scholarship. It may be we have the resources, but we don't have quite enough to reach as many students as that we would like to. And we know that you have this interest for, for however we know that, right? Um, and would you be willing to support whatever that programming is? So oftentimes you'll see is looking at what is our overarching goal? What is the overarching message? And then tweaking that message according to the constituency. I always joke with my team and previous teams that we can have the same message, but it's five different sources or channels to that message, right? So it feels redundant to us, but not to the person on the receiving end. And I say that because the one size fits all approach just does not work. Um, people, I feel like, understand and read all through that, right? Like this is one message that was just sent out to everyone. Um, the best example I have that in hopes that everyone uses Amazon is when you purchase something, they send you things that are related to what you purchased. 
and thinking that because you purchased this, you might like these three things. If they were to send you an email or a follow-up, with something else that is not even close to being related, you be like frowning. Like, why did I get this email? This makes no sense why I got this when I purchased slippers and now they're telling me, you know, I want an outdoor fire pit. Like, how does that go together, right? Um, so I think it's really starting to think of individuals as individuals. Um, the other piece to that, you'll see that I have to say that I think in higher ed happens a lot is that we say we have 300,000 alumni and then we put all those alumni into one big old group thinking because they're alumni that they all share warm and fuzzies about the university. That probably is not the case. And so then you have to do work within that even group, right? So it's not enough to say it's alumni, parents, so on and so forth. But even within that group, who do we have in that group? And allow those individuals to state their identities and customization and not allow us to just assume just because you're an alum, I know you want to know about this, right? Because not everyone has that. So it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of data science, you'll see, um, particularly in higher ed, of thinking about the particular group, using attributes within that group to decide how those groups then break down into smaller groups, then choosing messaging for those smaller groups, and then also knowing that we're not monolithic, right? I could have graduated from marketing, but also have an interest in art. So if you know those two pieces and attributes, then just don't lean in on marketing, but also lean in for art. So it's, I don't wanna say complicated, I would say it's complex, but we're complex beings. So what do you expect? Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think is a great lesson for news organizations and leveraging that data to help you see the multitudes of people that from a publisher's perspective, you can tell which subscribers are reading which stories ideally. And you can, if you know certain investigative stories or arts and culture stories or education resonates with someone, you can target the messaging based on, on their reading habits and their interests as well. Um, and I would imagine also that the messaging and the conversation um, depends on where if someone is in their journey with you as an organization exactly. as well. One of the conversations we had a couple of weeks ago at the News Philanthropy Summit across it is that these shouldn't just purely be financial transactions right. and relationships yeah. as well. But yes, that's part of it, but you want to build a sense of community and a sense of ownership over the organization and really how you think about messaging and, and, and how you can communicate and connect with folks can help mm -hmm. accomplish those goals as well. Right, right. And oftentimes you'll see it becomes unconscious to the person, right? Like it shouldn't be so obvious <laughs> that a person is quote unquote being put in a box or being trapped or it should just be a natural moment where, okay, I actually understand that. I'm going to use an example um, from my own journey. So my alma mater for uh, both my master's and my doctorate is from the University of Tennessee. I was also a staff member there. So I not only graduated with two degrees, but I was a staff member. Through the staff knowing who I was as a staff member, knowing my own personal story that I briefly have shared here, someone then reached out and said, Chandra, I think it'd be great if you served on our libraries board. And I thought that is brilliant. Right, because they, they understood what mattered to me. They understood that education mattered to me. They understood that books and what is contained in those books mattered to me, that I had no other avail but to say yes. Because I was like, they got it, right? And so now through that trajectory of serving on that board, everything that now comes my way is tied to that versus before, it was like all these athletics emails. Well, I don't really care about football. Yes, I know it's an SEC school, but that doesn't speak to me. So I really think it's really looking at people's behavior and then again, not putting them in a box, right? Like actually 
being organic as they go through their own journey and their season to say, oh, okay, they once thought this was important and now they don't feel that way anymore and navigate with. And that's that power with not over, right? I'm not gonna tell you what you think, what I think you should care about, but I'm gonna listen to your actual behaviors and words to understand what you care about and then let's do this together. So you'll see it'll be interesting to see as I navigate, like how will that change over time in terms of data science? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, it's good you don't care about football because I know Tennessee is having a little bit of a rough year. Um, I unfortunately care far too much about college football, but, um, but I think that's a really great point in that you're this you're on a journey with your donors as well, and it's part of an ongoing conversation. And so it's the way you talk to them should should reflect that. And it, that is interesting that you can um, evolve based on um, that. And and I guess I would imagine similarly that the platforms you're using to communicate with should um, exactly. define the tone and and things like that as well. I. Um, no, just from my own experience, we wrote an email to donors uh, a few months ago, and I addressed, it was a bulk email, and we personalized it, though, but I addressed the email as, hey, first person thinking it would be casual, and that person emailed us back and said, please don't refer to me like that. This is a much more formal mm -hmm. communication. So that was a good lesson for me to think even just these small details can impact how the tone and how you're talking to people. But if you're on social media, if you're doing email solicitations, if it's a stewardship email, as opposed to a solicitation email, that type of thing. I imagine all those types of details can affect the tone and um, how you address things as well. Absolutely, Yossi. And I would say it's really important that person that emailed you back and said, no, please don't refer to me this way. Like that should be attached to their profile, yeah. right? Like their name preference is really important. You know, I think many years ago and in some institutions are still living here, the archaic way of referring to a couple as Mr. and Mrs. is likely dead. <laughs> so you really need to see those people as individuals and understand their preference in terms of, of names. That was just you saying that brought that to mind that those small details really matter because if you mess that up, they likely won't read the rest of the message. Yeah, absolutely. My wife is a doctor and it drives her crazy to get yes. emails that say, no, Mr. Yes. and Mrs. So, um, anyone else have any other questions? I'm looking at Matt in the comments. Yes, so important to recognize that no group is a monolith. And I'm just thinking about this from a, a journalism perspective. So many of these are the conversations we're having in the journalism space as well, in terms of audience engagement and serving multiple audiences within your community and things like that. So it's it's heartening to hear that publishers, uh, we can leverage some of the same resources and thought processes to audience and community engagement to the donor and business side of, of things as well. Mm -hmm. And I actually think you'll see it's necessary, right? I mean, our world has shifted and the way that we see people, the way that we tell narratives should be shifting along with it. I have often said that I have no interest in going back to the way things were because the way things were before the pandemic were not serving the greatest good and the greatest whole. And so mm -hmm. if we know that to be true, and we get this opportunity again to get it right, knowing that we'll make mistakes along the way, let's shift our mindset to say, okay, maybe we should be telling this story a different way versus going back in the cavern um, of our past, um, but recreating something that can be new and powerful for generations to come. That's so interesting that you mentioned that, that even just within the past, more than a year and a half now of the pandemic that you've seen that shift happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. And a necessary one that I hope we can all take hold of in the smallest and even the largest ways, because I think it will go well, like I said, for generations to come. And, you know, going back to Jalen's question, donors are getting younger, right? You know, when you think about our entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, first generation students who are doing extremely and extraordinarily well, it's important to build those relationships with them then and not wait until 
the moment happens, right? And so that's why I really believe the time is really important, if not more important than just the treasure, because if you've built that relationship and you understand social justice and you understand how it matters to your institution, you likely will be light years ahead of so many others. Yeah, and I met, yeah, starting to see that already with, I imagine, with Gen Z and millennial right. folks and, and starting to build, build those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, terrific. Does anyone else have any other questions? If not, I think um, this might be a good place for us to wrap it up. I know it's Friday afternoon and folks are getting ready for the holiday and the weekend, so we can um, wrap it up. We'll share the recording of this and the slides as well, but Chandra, I just wanted to say thank you for an amazing conversation. I know I learned a ton and hopefully everyone else did as well and, and looking forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Yossi, and thank you to each of you for spending your afternoon with me. I consider it a gift. And again, feel, feel free to reach out. If you don't remember my name, just look up the inclusion firm um, if you need resources or support. Thank you so much, Yossi. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a really lovely weekend, and we'll hope to, to see you all soon.